Awesome. Hey, it sounds really good up here, Jack. We just did a microphone test. That's what I'm saying for. Hey, good morning. Good morning. It's great to see you here this morning. God bless you all. And um, I was laughing last night when Jill and Jill said, um, I don't know why God always wakes me up at three o'clock in the morning. And, um, but I can honestly say God's never woken me up to dance with angels. And um, that's a very much a Jill Austin thing. She actually had this um, um, liberty where she felt like um, she was able to play with and in the Holy Spirit. So she had this, she sort of had this unusual liberty that the Lord gave her. But anyway, um, the Lord did wake me up at 2.45 this morning. <coughs> how many people, how many of you get woken up like that in the night without any, yeah, isn't that amazing, eh? Or this whole lot of hands go up. And I was trying to work it out this morning. I said, why does God do that? It's like, um, but I wonder if it's because, you know, you're sound asleep and there's nothing going on tangibly in your mind. And then he wakes you up and it's almost like, all right, it's, you know, he's got to be saying something. And um, so I was up by three o'clock and went out. And this is what I felt. The Lord started off. I felt he just said, um, uh, you need uh, new mana every day. I thought, all right. <laughs> so I sat there and, um, and the Lord just, just uh, was just speaking to me and I, I wrote about four pages of notes out. I wrote out a couple of messages and, and the Lord was just putting stuff into my spirit. And I thought, then it was like, it just stopped. You know what I mean? You get to the point and it just stopped. And I thought, oh, he stopped. Oh, I'm going back to bed. So I went back to bed and had about another couple of hours sleep. And here we are again. And, um, but that's God. God works on his own timetable. And um, the more we get to know him, the more we realize we've got to fit in with him. He's not going to fit in with us. And, uh, you know, God is a God of miracles. And, um, and God certainly, uh, we certainly have to adjust our lives and our schedule to accommodate God. And God, God doesn't do that to accommodate us. So uh, it's good while I'm speaking here because it's like the lost sheep of Israel are all coming in. <laughs> and with coffee stains on their lips and... Uh, and crumbs, uh, um, crumbs on their on their arms, and that I can see the crumbs from here. Praise God. <coughs> I um, I was thinking about uh, this is not this morning's. I'm not giving you fresh mana at the moment. <coughs> um, but I, uh, this is, uh, you know, we hear really over these days, and and our emphasis is really on honouring the Holy Spirit, and um, and just remembering um, all of the wonderful things he's done in our lives and giving him praise and glory and honor uh, for every single time that he's ever encountered our lives. And because um, every time he's come and touched us, it's been life-changing for us. And it's just his goodness and his love and his grace. And the other day I was, I was, I was um, just thinking about things and um, <clears throat> I thought, I, I, this is what I wrote down. I thought, you know, I wrote down, Look, we've all suffered at the hands of Satan since the fall of humanity. Even the first, Adam and Eve, started right back there. They suffered, suffered at the hands of Satan. And, um, and it's really, really interesting because um, sometimes you think about it, you think, oh, if those guys didn't mess up, then the whole rest of the world wouldn't have been messed up. You know, it would have been nice if they didn't. What would have life been like? You know, what would it have been like for all of us to have, encountered God in a holy, glorious, wonderful, perfect, God-created state, you know. But anyway, we didn't get that journey. Um, we got another journey. Then I thought, oh, there's all sorts of consequences of sin. Like there's the sin of the fathers, um, like our parents. You know, a lot of us have grown up without godly parents. And um, there's consequences from that. Um, the sin of the fathers and mother, the sin of our brothers and sisters. There'd be people here this morning that... Maybe someone in your family close to you has done something horrendous and, and you suffer with the, with the consequences of what they did, the choices that they make, the sins of the sons and the daughters. You know, how many of us have had kids, you know, go off the rails and come back on the rails and, and, and there's a, see, we don't realize that we're all connected together and how it affects everybody gets affected by these things. And then the most grievous of all is our own sin, <laughs> isn't it? That's, that's the stuff that we really battle with, is, is our own battles. 
And then, um, and then it's really encouraging, though, because um, you know the Bible tells us we're all sinners, and that's an encouragement. Because um, you go back and you you look at um, David, you know, and and David messed up pretty majorly. Yet God said he was a man after His own heart, and that Jesus was coming in the line of David. Uh, Moses, well, he was a killer, didn't he? He killed somebody. Solomon had thirty concubines, or, or was it three hundred or something? The guy was a nutter. You think about it. You think about it. That you think about the rational side of that. Think about the food bill, the clothes, all of the clothes, all the shopping. He must have been caught anyway. Um, uh, Saul, New Testament, uh, murdered the Christians. Uh, kind of interesting. And um, Abraham was a liar. Father Abraham, that is. <laughs> Our father in the New Testament talks about how we're part of his family. Father, and he was a liar, lied about his wife, said it was his sister. And then I got this one. I came up with the worst one of all. The worst of all was Matthew because he was a tax collector. <laughs> we, we all know the IRS. Is, that's, that's like about as evil as you can get, isn't it? Because they're in, they're in here. Every time you, make, you, know, you work hard, you make a few dollars, they've got their big fat hand in there. And then they squander it. So, yeah, I think you need special grace if you're going to work in the tax department. You need to be praying every day, God, help me, God, help me. Um, and then, of course, then of course, you know, we, we have the Son of God. He was amazing. He comes and, um, and lives a holy life and um, taken up before the courts of man. And, um, and they give him a choice. You know, you can have Jesus, the holy, perfect one that lived a great life, or Barabbas, the criminal. And the crowd, the crowd is screaming, Barabbas, 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 give us, we want, give us Barabbas, we want Barabbas. Crucify the Christ. And um, it's, that, that's just really interesting um, because the season that we're going to come into in the church is going to be like that. It's, we, the reason that God is wanting to come with visitation in our lives in these days um, and he's wanting to reveal himself in a much greater way is because we're going to go into seasons battle. The world's changed. They're not ignoring the church. They're antagonistically anti the church of the Lord Jesus Christ now. Um, but it's really, it's really good for us. It's really good for us because the lines of demarcation are being drawn and, and we're going to find out who's in and who's out and who's born of God and who's not and what's actually going on. So I don't know about you. I get excited by that. I think this is the real church. The bride's going to stand up in these days. And then I thought, you know, the beautiful thing is that we don't stand before each other or God on our own merits. You know, we basically stand before each other. We stand before God on what Jesus Christ has done for us. And, and we stand in his righteousness. We stand in his merits and his merits alone. Um, so these are just some of my thoughts that I have. I, I, um, the thing about when we're sharing our supernatural encounters, the most important thing for us is always to keep our focus right, and that's is it's the God of miracles, not the miracles of God. It's the God of the encounter, not the encounters of God. And, and, and the way that we experience the encounters of God is by seeking the God of the encounter. And then when we, when we have that experience, that intimacy with Him, then the overflow of His presence overwhelms us I'm going to, I, I asked Jackson this morning if he would, with the tape, I thought um, if we can tidy it up a little bit. And um, the only reason, <coughs> I, I probably should have done it before, but the, um, the tape about my visitation, um, kind of I missed it a little bit with God because the Lord, when, he, when that happened to me, said that I was going to be a guinea pig and that he wanted to do publicly what he usually does privately. And I've kind of locked that away for 30 years, pretty much. And only ever shared little bits and pieces of it, and um, and what's happened with um, with what Jill did with the tape is she's edited it and then narrated it. And somebody's phone's going off there. Um, she edited it and then narrated it, and and it, and it's kind of changed it a bit because if she was there, but I was the one having the encounter at that time. So as she was narrating it, in my mind, I thought, no, that's not quite right. That's not what was actually happening. And I asked um, Jackson if he could just have the encounter. I've got to, we've got to go back and find the original tapes and, and, and see if we can put it. And, um, 
so we can so I can just explain it a little bit more just give you a little bit more detail around what God was actually doing in, in that experience and then and then the result of that um, the thing about it is um, how many people here you know that you've had uh, some form of a supernatural encounter with the Lord awesome that's incredible whether it's uh, whether it's an angelic visitation or a miraculous healing or your salvation experience was miraculous or God has done something supernatural and what we what we do have to understand is that we are we were created to be supernatural beings and we have a supernatural God and that's actually um, before the fall that's our home that's that's who we're meant to be and and so what happens through redemption is God bring is bringing us back to that state we get we get become spiritually alive again and in, in tune with the Holy Spirit, but all of the all of the power, all of the everything that's going to come onto the world to accomplish what God desires is going to come out of that spirit realm. It's going to come out of the heavenly realm, and um, I know I'm just taking a couple of minutes, but that's all right. You um, you don't have any choice. I've got the microphone, and um, I I do lots of. Um, Actually, at one session, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about prayer. I'm going to totally mess your prayer life up. Absolutely mess up your prayer life. Yeah, that's a pre-warning. You might want to just avoid that session. <clears throat> I'm not telling you when that session's on. <laughs> Exodus 20:22, 20, And the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven Deuteronomy 4 36 out of the heavens he let you hear his voice to discipline you and then on the earth he let you see his great fire and you heard his words from the midst of the fire Nehemiah 9 13 then you came down on Mount Sinai and you spoke with them from heaven Psalm 76 8 you caused judgment to be heard from heaven and the earth feared and was still. And I'll, I'll finish it off with Daniel. While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you. Isn't that interesting? Because Nebuchadnezzar, God just removed the power to be the king from Nebuchadnezzar at that point. It was just removed. But what, what I'm reading those for is I want you to see is that is that God speaks to us out of heaven. He's our heavenly heavenly Father, and the word of the Lord comes from heaven. And um, so, even when you're hearing the testimonies and everything, what you've got to do is you've got to tune your ear not to us, but to heaven. So, God, you know, when when God starts moving, He begins to speak to us. Often the preacher's preaching something, and you, God, speaking to you about something totally different. See, he, he brings revelation. When the when the spirit of revelation, when the Holy Spirit comes in the midst of a meeting, the spirit of revelation starts working, and you'll just pick up what you need. God, the Holy Spirit, just talking to you about what you need. And um, man, I just I just feel something's building here in the spirit. The Holy Spirit's just it's it's building, and um, and you know what um, what I find too about the anointing is it draws you. When, when God begins to come in the midst of us, it draws you. You just get drawn into his presence. And um, yeah, it's just so, so exciting. So Heavenly Father, we honor you. We love you. We glorify you. We magnify you. We lift you up. You're our Father. We thank you for what Nancy shared, Father, how she was able to run into your throne room and hop up on your knee. And the love that she experienced, that great love, your great love towards us, your children. And Father, we want to we want to draw near to you like that today. And Holy Spirit, we know you're God on earth right now. You're in us, you're on us, you're around us. And we surrender ourselves afresh to you this morning and just say, Holy Spirit, speak, touch, um, have your way. May your will be done. We just surrender to you. We give up, Lord. We just give up over to you. And of course, we pray all of these things and we so welcome you, Jesus, in the midst of us. You're our Savior. You're our Lord. You just, you just did so much. You just 
it's hard for us to understand the level of sacrifice that you offered up for us. And uh, we just honour you and we love you. And let's, let's just stand together. Um, and we're just going to push into some worship. And uh, just before we do, I just, want us, I just want us to start this morning just by applauding the Lord. Just by, let it come out of your heart. Let that attitude of gratitude, praise and adoration and glory. Oh, thank you. Thanks, guys. morning church to find your place we love your presence Lord I raise I raise a hallelujah in the presence of I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief Every voice I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me And I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will The King is alive. You are alive. You see it on the throne. I raise, I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. Yes. I raise a hallelujah. In the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah. In the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, in the middle of the storm.
calling out, we're 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 calling out for the face, for the face on me, for the face on me. Fall afresh on me. Fall afresh on me.
seated. Hey, thank you team, that was fantastic. And uh, Corey and Renee, God bless you guys. <laughs> and Corey's, um, uh, Nancy and I, is our oldest son and Renee of course is his wife. And uh, we're just going to have them come and share just whatever. <laughs> God bless you guys. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Just have to bear with me as I get set up here. Oh gosh, I um, oh, God is good. I mean, and um, God is just so uh, good. And I was just thinking this morning, actually, we couldn't sleep really much last night. I don't know if it's the time zone. We've just come back from overseas and it's kind of that, but we were also just awake and talking. And I started to think this morning about my life and I started to see the hand of God on my life. You know, my parents were saved in 1972 some of you here actually know my mum, my late mum and my dad, who's still with us, still with me, amen. And I was just remembering when I was a child, my dad was building a house for my uncle and auntie up on Kashmir Hills. And I was a young child, I can't remember how old I was, I know I was in primary school and it was a Saturday and I went with dad and I don't know how, I no ACC or OSH back then, I'm guessing, because I was actually on the second story with dad and my uncle. And the frames were up but the walls weren't in. And I was just sitting there talking to Dad. And I leaned back. And because I leaned back um, and a framing was too high, I actually fell down to the bottom floor. 
concrete at this point. And um, I remember Dad saying that I almost bounced. The only thing that was wrong with me was a small broken bone in my foot. And I felt the Holy Spirit said to me this morning that the angels protected me at that moment. I've always loved the book of Joshua. And I think as I was thinking about the encounters of God, they're like a journey. And Joshua was given the role of um, possessing the promised land. And I kind of looked at my life and I thought, God has allowed me to possess in journeys. And, And I was one of those Christian kids that slept on a Sunday night or was playing out in the hallway with my friends while church was happening. I loved church growing up. I knew God the Father. I knew that he was real. There was no one that could tell me that God wasn't real. I knew Jesus Christ. I knew the price he'd paid for me. I look back on my life and I can see Jericho moments when the walls just came down and the victory was easy. And then the next stage in Joshua's journey was the Battle of Ai. And I don't have time to go into it because I'm very aware of time. He's sitting here patiently. (laughs) I'm always the emotional one. (laughs) But the victory was lost and Joshua was broken. And he was down on his face before the Lord saying, what happened? We've gone from this incredible victory to defeat. We should have been able to beat them. And God says to Joshua, get up, Joshua, for there's sin in the camp. You know, one man had taken the things that God had said they were not allowed to take. That was the first victory. That was God's tithe, if you get what I'm saying. That was God's, he did it, the great I am, Jehovah. No man was to take glory from that. No man was to take the spoil. And yet one man did. And God spoke to Joshua and said, Joshua, what are you doing praying? Get up and deal with the sin. And there's been moments in my life when it's been like that, where God has dealt with the attitudes, where God has dealt with the the weaknesses, the flesh. Fast forward to 17 years old. I was at a camp. I remember Trevor Yaxley prayed for me. And he just started to speak about the love of the Father. I think my personality type tends to strive, tends to want to be a good girl, do everything right, tick the boxes, cross the T's, dot the I's. People that work with me know that. But I just needed to know the love of the Father. That no matter what I did or what I said or where I went or who I was, he just loved me. I went to breakout camp, which was up in Auckland, and it was at that time that I was baptised in the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. And it's really from that time that life changed. The Holy Spirit became very personal to me. And as I look back on my journey and the encounters and the deliverance and the freedom from generational curses and bondages that had come down the family line, God set me free. I remember once in New Brighton Road, this is probably 94, 95, and there was a circle of us. I know exactly in the room where I'm sitting in the front lounge near the little kitchenette, those of you that know the room, and Mel Maloney was making his way. I was the last one, and I felt like this lightning bolt. And I knew something was happening, but I didn't have the rational mind to understand, but I knew there was a sovereign move happening in my life at that moment. And Mal places his hands on me and I feel this wrestle. I wanted to be free. And I remember Mal getting firm. (laughs) You remember Mal? And he said, you will go in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And I was set free. I screamed to the point where I had no voice left. And I remember talking to Mal afterwards and I said to Mal, what happened? And he said this demonic spirit said to him, I'm not leaving, I've been here since she was a baby. And that's when he evicted that foul thing and said, it's time to go. 
Now, that, I don't know where that generational curse came from. I don't know how that thing entered. I had a loving family, a loving parents, but the Holy Spirit knew. And as I look back on my journey, a bit like Joshua going through the promised land, God prepared me in my 20s and my 30s for the battles that were to come. You know, one of the things that happened when I came into this church after the breakout camp, I missed the 21 days, but I was here for a lot of the move. I remember the concrete. I remember the dip down there. It was just a revelation of the spiritual realm. The demonic forces, I don't give the enemy any credit. We are responsible for our own sin. But in our sin and in our bondage and in our deception and in our blindness, we give him freedom. And so I'm very aware of the spiritual realm. I'm very aware of the heaviness that comes down upon people and the burdens and the bondages people carry. I'm very aware of the assignments It says in 1 Peter, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Many times when I've been praying for people, this scripture's come to my mind in 2 Timothy. If God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth and they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. That has been a prayer that has been on my heart for many people over the years that the Lord has led me to pray for. I remember reading Frank Peretti, This Present Darkness, and my eyes were opened to a whole different level of the angelic and how the enemy uses weaknesses in people's lives and attacks the church. I was thinking of Psalm 127, and I'm finishing, I'm not going to take long, I promise. Unless the Lord builds a house, we labour in vain who build it, but it's the second part that speaks to me. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the victory of Christ in the realm of the Spirit who made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. They're not just under his feet, they're under our feet. I want to take you just to Joshua... uh, I just love Joshua, but I don't have time to go into it. But just real quickly, in Judges 6 and 7 about Gideon, we've all heard about Gideon in the wine press, hiding. Excuse me, the people of Israel had been disobedient before the Lord, and so they came under captivity of the Midianites for many years. It actually says that the Midianites would take their flocks, and it talks about in Judges 6 how they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous of locusts. You know, the promise of God is that he would restore the years the locusts have eaten. It says in verse 6, So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. I've had moments like that. God calls Gideon. Gideon's full of fear. I've had moments like that. He promises him over and over again that the love of God just proves to Gideon time and time again. He even says to him, Gideon, if you're still afraid, go here. And he proves himself to him again. God is so gracious and so loving. When he calls, he gives you the equipment to do what you need to do. So we're in the battle. We have 130... 5,000 Midianites against 32,000 Israelites. God says to Gideon, the army's too big. I don't want them taking glory. Tell all the men who are afraid to go home. He's left with 10,000 men. 22,000 men, Scarpa. Ever felt like you're alone in the battle? Then God says, Gideon, there's still too many. And he says, I want you to take them to the watering hole. And those that lap like dogs, with their eyes out on the territory to see, they can stay. But the rest who get comfortable 
and think about themselves and go down on their knees, they can go. He's left with 300 men. It was like one Israelite to 350 or 450 Midianites. Wow, unwinnable battle, eh? I've been up against some unwinnable battles. But Zechariah 4 6. Not by might. Sorry. Nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Therefore, it doesn't matter to God. He wouldn't share the glory. Now, this is the next, but I just want to have this bit here. The strategy. God gives Gideon an incredible strategy. And I think when it comes to warfare and winning the battles, God's going to give us incredible strategies. The Holy Spirit's going to speak to us as individuals, as families, as churches, as cities, and give us strategies. Some strategies are going to be in prayer in the spiritual realm. Some strategies are going to be manifested in the natural. But he'll give us divine strategies. So he has three groups of 100 men. And the Lord shows them what to do and he says to the men, this is what you're to do. They have their big pot of, uh, pots and a torch with a flame and a trumpet. This is night time and they have the flame hidden in the pot. They break up into three different sections. They're in a valley. Excuse me, this is really undignified. <laughs> And what they are to do is to break the pots, let the light be released, and blow the trumpet. Now you can imagine the enemy at this point. All they're seeing is light being released, pots being broken. They're hearing the echo because there's three groups of 100, and the trumpets are sounding. In the end, the enemy is defeated. Long story. I can't go into it. But in the end, the Israelites win. I thought about that. We are the pot, and he is the potter. And sometimes he has to break our lives to release the light, to let his glory shine. And the trumpet speaks to me of the victory, the sounds, the music, the breakthrough. I want to finish with this. There's just so much more, but I'm just very aware of time. Years and years ago, around about 1996, there was a minister that came into our church. Those of you will remember him, Ruckins McKinley, and he shared the scripture, and I can't remember anything else he said but this scripture. And there's been this scripture was illuminated to me by the Holy Spirit at the time, and I've never, ever forgotten it. So it's Isaiah 9, verse 5, and I'm going to read about it in a minute. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. No battle we go through that the Holy Spirit gives us the keys to go through, that we submit and surrender to him and he gives us the victory. No battle goes undone. The enemy hates it when we win. And we're winning because of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the name above all names. You know, when there's a little bit in the story where the name of Gideon, because of a dream, had got out there, he was made a little bit famous. The enemy was afraid. When they're breaking the pots and the light comes out and blowing the trumpets, they're yelling out for the Lord and Gideon. When we go into battle, it's for Jesus Christ. That's the name that we declare and that's the name the enemy is afraid of when the light of God comes out. Look, there's just so much more, but I just think I'm going to finish there. But I just, just want to say I'm just really grateful to the Lord. Because my life's been a bit like Joshua. 
the highs and the lows, the victories, the battles, the mountains. But God is faithful. And there is not one thing that he will allow you to go through that he will not bring you out the other side. And I need to finish by honouring my husband as the head of our home, as the father of our three wonderful children. And I honour him this morning. And I'm very honoured and blessed to be able to share just a little bit of what the Lord and the Holy Spirit has shown me. And I hope that he gets the glory. Quite difficult for me to be here, to be fair, like um, I got an email from Dad while we are away, uh, and actually it wasn't an email, it was a schedule for the conference with my name on it. <laughs> <laughs> and at that moment I felt like Jesus let this cup pass from me. <laughs> <laughs> I make light of it, but the um, the battle of uh, standing back in the office that God has called me to is is a challenge. So, Lord, this morning I pray that you would anoint me to stand in the office that you've called me to. That prayer's for me, not for you. <laughs> I'm a testimony of God's grace and his mercy. Had some really amazing times, amazing uh, years, and some really challenging years too. But through God's grace, we're still here. <laughs> and um, I want to share a few scriptures. Um, I'm going to keep it short for you this morning. Um, I'm going to share a very short snippet of our my story in the context of just our upbringing and where we got to. Then I'm going to finish on an encounter that happened um, during the outpouring of the Holy Spirit here, uh, an angelic encounter, and I want to share some scriptures related to that. The Gaithers actually, um, I believe it's their, I believe it's their song, something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful out of my life. And um, sometimes we get broken because God needs to do a work in us and through us and um, that work is important, very important. I was born in 1972, um, actually just before I go there, just one more scripture, the book of Psalms 51 verses 16 and 17. Um, and this is sort of the tail end of one of David's psalms. And he says, um, For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. This is verse 16. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. And, um, you know, the amazing thing is, is that David's journey was a troubled journey, yet his heart remained right before God and he just continually went back. There is a key, I believe, and the key is repentance. 
and that's the doorway, right? That's the doorway in to encounter with God is genuine repentance. And we can't do it in our own strength. We can't do it in our own way. We have to come with a spirit of repentance before him. 1972, I was born. Um, Mum was about 16. Uh, unmarried, so that makes me a bastard. <laughs> and that's a... That's a private family joke because both the boys, every so often we joke with each other, says, you know, Dad, you're a bastard. <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> but you know, God had other plans. Uh, at the age of four, I went to Bible college. I studied for three years, <laughs> and I graduated to become a pastor's kid. <laughs> the journey that your family goes through is very much the journey that you go through as well, and um, uh, even though I'm, I'm not super talkative type, I don't say a whole lot. I watch and observe, observe a lot, and over the years, uh, you know, I've seen, seen everything. The good, the bad, the ugly, the challenges, the battles. As a pastor's kid, you get to sit out on discussions that are well beyond your years. You get to hear things that you maybe shouldn't hear. You get to see things you maybe shouldn't see. Uh, I've met lots and lots of pastors and leaders and prophets and apostles and teachers from all around the world. As a result, the byproduct has just been in, in the house. I remember uh, when we moved to Christchurch, uh, I was never really keen. I didn't, didn't really enjoy Christchurch that much. The weather was a bit cold. I think um, we'd gotten spoilt when we were in Australia. Um, so once I'd once we'd come back from Mackay, North Queensland, we were used to running around in shorts and T-shirts and no shoes, and Christchurch was a bit of a shock, you know, to be fair. Um, but, you know, God started to work, and we, we followed, you know, with what mum and dad were doing. We were um, intrinsically connected to the journey, to their journey. Sometimes association is a really, really difficult thing. You know, we... You know, like Peter, um, in the New Testament, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, I think they were praying. And remember, the, the Judas had just come to portray Jesus. And Peter had lopped off the centurion's ear, and he, they were dragged off. And, and Peter goes into, into that trial of, of uh, denying Christ, denying Jesus three times, and he didn't want to associate. I, I was reading those scriptures again, and, and I recognised that, that Peter was overcome with fear, you know, at that stage, because, because Jesus was carted away, and there was a guy by the name of Cephas who'd, who'd put forth this great idea that this man should die for the sake of everyone else. <clears throat> And sometimes we find it hard to associate. Uh, we don't want to associate with Jesus in the workplace. We don't want people to know. We don't want to associate with Celebration Centre at church because it's difficult, <laughs> you know. Uh, I've got the trifecta. I'm a Christian in Celebration Centre and a Watkinson. bit hard to disassociate from being a Watkinson, although I did consider changing my name to Wilkinson. <laughs> no, 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 that's the Watkinsons. My name's Corey Wilkinson. <laughs> but we've got to get to the point where we own the associations that God connects us to. 
and we don't choose where we're born. We don't choose the family we're born into. Uh, they, they are part of our journey. They are part of our walk. So uh, we come to Christchurch as a part of the journey. We are in a little wee church down the road called the Church of the Nazarene. Um, it's a smaller work, but you know God's faithful and he's, he's, working, he's working there. And then Dad gets baptised in the Holy Spirit. And spoils it for everyone. <laughs> Not really. So that was a real challenge because, of course, theologically it was a big difference. It was a big shift and not everyone that was in the church at that time could, could handle that shift. And some had to go. And, you know, that's always a painful, a painful uh, thing when members of the body or the family go, right? But the work continues and we get to uh, 1990, I believe it was, around about. I actually might have been a little bit earlier than that. We were just teenagers, young teenagers. And at that, at that point in time, there was a, just a, an amazing church in the city called City New Life, Majestic House. And Dad used to go to the conferences and different things. And we'd go as kids, we'd go to the conferences. I was always amazed by the crowds of people, you know, it was hundreds upon hundreds of people there, and the worship, man, the worship that was there in the house was amazing, and I, looking back, I recognised the worship was a part of the move, that it was connected, intrinsically connected. And we were young teens and really, really excited, and um, one day I, um, I'd met Pastor Peter Morrow, um, you know, at the church, and he'd invited Myself, Kelly, and a bunch of other young people, it would have been maybe, maybe no more than 10 or 12 of us from around the city. And we were only young teens. We were like, you know, 14, 15, 16, those sorts of years. And he says, I, I, I'm, he said, I'm calling a young Joshua group together. It was his terminology, a young Joshua group together. And he invited us to his house. And we went, we went to the house and prayed. And he taught us through his, his, his life, I suppose, through his lifestyle prayer. And we, we went there and um, prayed. It's deeply impacted me, you know, all these years. We get to 1990 and we have another encounter and this time it's around the Rise Up Camp. And uh, it was, um, I guess it was an encounter where, you know, we'd, we were baptised in the Holy Spirit by the stage, but it was, there was a commissioning, there was a sort of a setting to the call that took place over that time, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit began to flow, and we saw um, deliverances and healings, and things began to sort of just unlock. And we would have been about 17, 18 in that sort, of, that sort of age bracket. We get to 1992, and of course we're following the journey of the church, and we were roller skating rink to a place over here, the carpet factory, we'd moved into here. Uh, probably at the start there was only two bays. Big hole in the ground over there, no carpet, pretty shabby chairs. It was, it was rough, rough and ready. But there was, there was an encounter that took place uh, over those over those meetings as God's Spirit was poured out and the anointing of the Holy Spirit was poured out. Not everything I understood, not everything I understand to this day still. A lot of things can't be explained rationally, they just happened. But um, what had actually happened as a result of, of those meetings was another encounter, another encounter God, you know, and I look back on my life and I see, you know, where God's intersected my life throughout various stages of the journey, and this was another intersecting. And um, there was an altar call, there was sort of altar calls in every service and things happening in every service, and I was up here somewhere around the front, and I just remember this intense heat had come had come on me, there was like a, a fire that was going through the church, you know, it was, it was one of the things that was happening. 
and um, and I was standing at the front um, there, and everyone around me they were having their own encounter. So it was kind of like it was just a personal personal thing. And um, I guess the um, let me just pull up a, a scripture here from the book of Isaiah. Um, what had happened is that as we were praying, and um, I think someone had laid hands on me, I'm not exactly sure because my eyes were closed, I was just in this moment and this incredible heat just started coming over my body. I recognised it was supernatural straight away, I recognised that there was something happening and um, the eyes of the spirit were just opened at that time to the angelic and it was an encounter that I probably never forget. I don't think about it often, but it's unforgettable in that sense. And what had happened was that an angel, and I'm sure lots of people at that time were having other angelic encounters and different things, but an angel had come. I, I knew it was an angel. I could see the outline. It had wings. I knew it had wings. It, ha it was made of a substance that was not earthly, I knew that just by the spirit, it was just something that, it, that, it, that I just knew, there was, you know, and it had this, uh, it had this coal, about so big, that it picked up with tongs and put on my lips, and I didn't, I didn't understand at that, I was only young, 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 I didn't understand the encounter, the, the, what, what it was fully, although I was experiencing the encounter, you know, in the front. And um, I remember uh, might have told mum or, um, you know, had, had told mum about it before and, and we discussed it and I talked about the coal. I said, it's not coal, it's coke. You, know, you remember when you get coal fires, you used to buy bags of coal and bags of coke? I, I knew that it was coke. And I didn't, I didn't know how I knew, but I just knew it was coke. And it's funny because this morning I, I was prompted just to look up the scriptures again in, in Isaiah chapter 6. And I recognised straight away the encounter. I saw it in scripture. Isaiah 6, it says in the year, this is Isaiah um, when he's called to be a prophet, the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and a train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one with six wings, and two he covered with his face, and two he covered with his feet, and two he flew, and one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, your sin is purged. And also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. And that was the, that was the, the very same encounter that I had at, in, in those meetings in the, in the move. I was prompted this morning because I was just wrestling, you know, um, with this concept of coke. And I hadn't really looked at this in any detail before, but I, I looked up quickly on Google um, the the what Coke was, and I know what it looks like, and it's kind of, um, you know, it's got holes and it's pitted and whatever have you. But it was interesting because it's, the description of Coke was, it's used in a blast furnace to create iron. It burns hotter than coal. And I recognised when the, the encounter that 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 it was a that 
God was wanting to blast furnace me. Sometimes I still feel I'm in the blast furnace. <laughs> I haven't quite jumped out yet. <laughs> but the purpose was to make iron, to make you strong, to make you be able to stand. We have a private joke, myself and Renee, and, um, you know, sometimes you get those moments, you know, like the moment when I got the email and saw myself on the schedule. It's like, oh, oof, you know, the emotions just go, because it's kind of like it triggers a, triggers something, you know, emotionally. And um, um, Renee says, you, you put wings on that and just let it fly away. <laughs> you know, those, these things come and bombard your mind, your emotions at times. And you, you put wings on that and just let it fly off. This morning, I, I said to her before she came out, you need some pretty big wings. <laughs> <laughs> Last night, um, early hours in the morning, laying in bed, just pondering upon the service and um, just thinking about things and um, haven't actually got to many of my scriptures. Realise that. And um, I began to began to to see the city in a different way. I began to see the church in a different way. Um, I began to hear the Spirit of the Lord speaking um, about different situations, prophesied. I got a word. It's not related to the church, but it's related to our global situation and um, it's a it's it's a word that I don't don't use in everyday life but it just it just came to me and it was calamity. There is coming waves of calamity to the earth. And uh, um, I don't understand the context of that but I know it's soon that there's there's uh, there's things in motion already uh, globally, I'm talking. And um, the other part to it was partly time-framed, but um, partly related to the church. Um, and I, I just believe prophetically that we have a short window of opportunity to strengthen and mature the body. Uh, I don't like giving dates and times and not sort of um, you know, as bold and confident to do that but I, I did feel there's a term of two years there's a term there's a term of two years where the body needs to be strengthened there's a term of two years where the body needs to be matured um, I was reading again in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. And um, the thing about uh, Ephesians is it's a very powerful book. Um, there's a lot of things in the book of Ephesians that, that are there, but one of the things is in relation to these scriptures we know very, very well. Verse 11, and he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And I believe this is, look, this has been important since the scripture was written. But maybe, uh, maybe there's a greater importance on the function of this in this season of time for the church. And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith. And I got stuck there. <laughs> till we all come to the unity of the faith. Till we all come to a place of unity in our faith.
and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joint and knit together. And when I read those verses, the whole body, I don't see it as a singular body, like Celebration Centre is a singular, it's not a body, it's a part. We need to understand God's perspective on the body of Christ. It's not, we're not, the body is incomplete as a single church. I, I believe that. From whom the whole body, joint and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And I really just got, I mean, I've read that scripture, I can't tell you how many times, hundreds, if not thousands of times. Um, but it was fresh again to me today, you know, um, reading it again, it was fresh in, this, in the context of the word that had dropped into my spirit last night about calamity coming to the nations, the body having to come together in unity to strengthen, to be strengthened. Um, and I, I, I think a better name for it is City Church because it drops away the, the labels, all of our own labels, that we're meant to be functioning as a city church together in one accord with one purpose one plan to see the souls of this city impacted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's going to take the functioning and releasing of the fivefold ministry gifts within the body. And again, the definition of body is not single church, it's not singular church, it's the body because, you know, celebration might be a hand and another fellowship might be a foot and another fellowship might be an arm but it's just really important that we understand that there's coming a season of time now where it's becoming imperative for the church to mature quickly. The thing about the scripture is that it actually, Ephesians doesn't give us any option for a second tier maturity, like the level of maturity is to the fullness of Jesus Christ. You know, that's a bit frightening, isn't it? Um, because I think that's what's going to be needed to stand. And I, I see, sometimes I just see things with pictures and, and just impressions in my mind and spirit, but I just see like the church emerging, you know, like just coming up, elevating up, out, and the church will assemble together like that the body, and I, I believe prophetically that there's going to come, um, and I'm not, I'm not the one to orchestrate these things or do these things, but I, I believe prophetically there's, there's going to come a, quite a significant shift in the function of the church within our city, right? And you need to understand what that means because it's not the position of the church, it's not our position, it's the function of the church has to shift and so that was the that was the word that was the word for me and for you, uh, the body this morning. And I want to just give um, God the glory and honour uh, that He sticks closer than a brother. He's right there, and He's always there to help us, to guide us, to lead us. And you know, um, if there was one thing that I could leave us with, you know, with this session, is I know we're acknowledging the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And the one thing I want to leave us with today is that repentance is the key to opening the door to the move of the Spirit. And um, by association, you know, I, I am connected to the vision of the house. By calling, I'm connected to the vision of the house. It's hard to get away from that. Our family is connected to the vision of the house and the city. It's even harder to get away from that. <laughs> but I believe that many of us here as families in the city, we're connected spiritually to the vision of what God wants to do in the city. So I bless you, church. I uh, pray that the word settles in your heart and spirit. And um, we want to give the Holy Spirit the honour and Father, we just welcome you into this place this morning. Father, every stumbling block, every barrier, everything that stands in the way of us having that clear conduit with you, Lord, we put it at the foot of your cross. And we ask that truly we would be able to be conduits of your spirit, that your Holy Ghost would just come and have freedom and liberty in your people. Let it be a hallmark of this week of gatherings, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would come and breathe upon us. And I just, you know, I, I feel and sense again that there are new worship sounds that God wants to release and unlock uh, in this season of time. And I remember many meetings um, during the move of the Holy Spirit in 92 where, you know, angelic was released in the worship and the prophetic was released in the worship. And I believe that's coming it's coming again, the, the breathing of the fresh and new. Not that we go back, but there's new sounds, there's things that God wants to unlock before us and to release and, and speak over us and declare in the atmosphere. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you. And we honour you and we lift you up in this place. And we want to magnify the name of Jesus Christ, that he would be glorified. We will not deny you, Jesus. We will lift you up and magnify you that all men may come to know you. And we give you the glory and the praise for it. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise God. Thank you, guys. That was awesome. It's kind of sort of feel... How do you explain it? <laughs> That's how I feel. <laughs> oh, we need to put the heaters on all the practical things that go through my mind when I'm sitting there thinking it's getting a bit cool in here why aren't the heat pumps going <laughs> but um, what we're going to do is we'll take a break and have a cup of tea and uh, a scone and we'll put the heaters on and we'll warm up and then after that uh, Mike and Ali are going to be sharing with us and uh, it's just going to be awesome amen amen and amen